Welcome to the, the TTIP panel. So what we have, we have five, five very good speakers tonight to finish this awesome PPAU conference. So we have Mr. Glyn Moody, we have Mr. Ben Bogers, then we have Willy Kampan, also Kostas Rosoglu, and Gregory Engels. So with these five people, we have the consumer aspect of the TTIP with, the, with Mr. Rosoglu, who is uh, for the European Consumer Organization. Then we have Mr. Moody, who knows a lot about the topic, who has do uh, 18 updates about that and write a lot about, about it. Then we have Ben, who is very active on the social network to push the information to the people to act about it. And we have also uh, Willy, who is uh, active for the German agriculture industry. So it's the other side of the TTIP. Is uh, what they can, what we can have with people who think it's positive. And we have also Gregory, who has the another approach of the thematic. So I propose to begin with Glenn Moody about it. So Mr. Moody, thank you very much. Great pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, I think this conference has been really great, uh, very impressed by the depth of the subjects. And so the question has to be, why on earth are we talking about a trade agreement? Because everybody knows trade agreements are really boring. Uh, if they're not boring, then everybody's in favor of them because they just make everybody rich and there's no problem. So why on earth are we talking about it? Well, because the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership is not a trade agreement. According to the European Commission's own figures, only 20% of the supposed benefit of this will come from getting rid of trade barriers. The other 80% comes from what they call non-tariff barriers. Now that sounds okay, just a technical term, but actually non-tariff barriers are what you and I call environmental protection, health and safety protection. It's all the standards that we know and love. In fact, they are integral to the European way of life. And that's why we're talking about it, because TTIP in many ways is an assault on the European way of life. And so the question is, how are they going to try and do this? Because what they want to do is to make the European system and the US systems compatible. And when you've got standards, how can you do that? Well, you can either level up so you can get the Americans to adopt the EU system, and we all know they're going to do that, or you can level down, which means we adopt their system. And in fact, the European Commission swears they won't do that. So if you believe them, that's, maybe that's the solution. Or you can have mutual recognition, whereby everybody accepts everything, but that's really a leveling down too. Or you can have what's called convergence, where you try and bring the two systems together over time. And that seems to be what they're trying to do. We've had a leak of a document that talks about the creation of something called a regulatory council, which will basically sit in the middle of the Atlantic somehow, <laughs> and we'll look at all US and EU laws for the future and we'll basically veto those that get in the way through these nasty non-tariff barriers. So what that effectively does is puts the issue of trade above all others. It's saying that trade is the fundamental thing we should care about and if we have environmental legislation that starts to bring in problems, we get rid of it or we don't bring it in. So that's another reason why we need to worry about this. Now, the European Commission will probably say, well, that was just a discussion document. But we do know that one thing they're pushing for is something that many of you may have heard of, which is Investor State Dispute Settlement, ISDS. And this has already become the most contentious part of TTIP. In fact, it's so contentious, the Commission has agreed to have a consultation on it, which they weren't originally going to do. Now, the basic idea is quite good. It was saying that when Western investors put money in countries where the legal system isn't very strong and where the government has a habit of marching into factories and stealing all your machinery, you have a, a way of actually saying, well, that wasn't fair. Can we have some court case outside your country to get our money back? But unfortunately, it's been subverted by the big companies, as they tend to do. So, for example, Australia and Uruguay have brought in laws to require plain packages for cigarettes. And so Philip Morris is now using this ISDS mechanism to sue Australia and Uruguay for what they claim is an indirect expropriation of future profits. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. They are claiming that they have lost future profits because laws have been brought in that will stop people smoking as much as they would have done. And this is really what ICS does. Canada wants to ban some pesticides. It wants to bring in a moratorium on fracking. 
So naturally, the companies that were going to sell pesticides and carry out fracking are suing Canada for the lost profits. In fact, Canada is being sued by Eli Lilly, uh, it's a pharmaceutical company from the US, because Canada didn't give it two patents on drugs, because Canada's patent system and court said they weren't worth having patents. So what does Eli Lilly do? It sues Canada for the lost profits it would have had had it been given the patents that it shouldn't have. Now the reason Canada is getting hit is because they foolishly signed up to this ISDS 20 years ago in something called the North American Free Trade Agreement. And they are actually victims of this as a result. And you can see what would happen if this ISDS is in TTIP. Because in, EU, in the European Union we've got fracking, we've got genetically modified organisms, pesticide bans, uh, even software patents. All of those would probably lead to being sued for hundreds or even billions of dollars by American companies. So this is a really big problem, not least because it has a chilling effect on the future laws. We know again from Canada, from people inside the government that said that when they were proposing new environmental legislation, they got very nice letters from American lawyers saying, well, it's obviously your right to bring in environmental legislation, but we will sue you for several billion dollars if you do for the lost future profits. So strangely, those laws didn't come in. So it has a chilling effect on the future. Now, the European Commission says, well, we need this to attract investment. In fact, the US investment in the EU is three times higher than all of Asia. The EU investment in the US is eight times higher than India and China. The US invests 1.3 trillion euros in Europe. The EU invests 1.4 trillion euros in the US. So this is a non-problem that they're trying to foist on us. Okay, so this ISDS has got to go, and I think it will. Okay, so I've, I've been concentrating a bit on the disbenefits. Let me talk about the benefits. Well, how do we work out the benefits of this TTIP? Well, you have to model things. And basically, there are only really two main models that have been put together. One has been put together by the Bertelsmann Stiftung. And they've got a very de detailed breakdown of how every industry will do and who will make money. Such like. I just want to pull out one sentence from their rather large, uh, impressive report. But there's just one sentence I want to bring out. It said that the levelling of the barriers with the USA thus leads to a decline in trade that came about as a result of preferential treatment of intra-European trade flow. Now, put into English, what that means is that some of the flow within the European Union goes to the US. And so a paradoxical effect of TTIP will actually be a hollowing out of the European Union and its economic structures because people will start selling to the US rather than to the people within the European Union. And this is something I don't think that people have been aware of, and certainly the European Commission hasn't brought out, that TTIP actually undermines the European Union. Now, I'll finish by talking about the other main piece of research, which comes from the European Commission itself. This is the main document that is used to sell TTIP. Every journalistic report on TTIP that I've seen quotes this document, in particular quotes the figures used, so that's why it's very important. They look at basically two scenarios. One is getting rid of those tariffs, the ordinary tr trade stuff, which they claim would give an extra uh, European Union GDP growth of 24 billion euros. That's 0.1%, not very impressive. Under the ambitious comprehensive scheme, which they obviously advocate, you get an extra um, European GDP growth of 119 billion euros, and that's the figure you will see everywhere. That's 0.48%. However, what they don't say, and I would please take this away, is that this figure of 119 billion is in 2027. And it is the difference between what you would have in 2027 without TTIP and what you would have with TTIP. So it is the cumulative growth, not the growth each year. And so this 0.5% extra that the European Commission is talking about is 10 years growth. The real growth is 0.05% each year extra. And yet the Commission has never said that figure. That is the real extra GDP growth per year that TTIP would produce. One thing I've got to tell you, that is the most optimistic scenario they talk about. That is assuming everything goes according to plan. So the real growth is actually going to be less than 0.05%. It's going to be 0.02% or 0.01%. That is statistically indistinguishable from zero. The European Commission has not made any case that there is any benefit, even in their own modelling. So my question I leave with you is, is this worth it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for that. 
So after the, the point of view of the states and the organization, I want to show the, to, to show the point of view of the citizen and of the, of the consumer. So maybe I can ask to, to Costas if, uh, what are the consequences of the TTIP for the, for the EU consumer? Because you are a representative of the European Consumer Organization. So I leave you the words. Uh, great, many thanks. Um, no surprise there. As you can imagine, uh, BEUC, which is the European Consumer Organization, and the consumer organizations in the US under the platform of the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue, we are very concerned about the impact of TTIP on consumer protection. And we see TTIP as a massive exercise to bring down uh, consumer protection standards. Uh, just as a reminder, a high level of consumer protection is a fundamental right under Europe. And then, as every fundamental right, you cannot sit um, on negotiation table when you give and take. Uh, it's not a commodity. Uh, there are re really long-standing standards of consumer protection in Europe, and we see that attempts uh, to bring those standards down. Uh, in, in every possible area of consumer, of consumer uh, concern. In other words, talk about food, chemicals, uh, financial services, uh, hardcore consumer protection, uh, data flows, uh, copyright, and uh, sustainability. Every piece, of, uh, every piece of consumer legislation is affected. Um, and what we fear is that since in many areas the two systems are not compatible, we cannot make them interoperable. It is impossible. Uh, just to give you the example of uh, the privacy data protection, which is very relevant, um, there is discussion about, uh, for example, including data flows in the uh, trade agreement, which for me does not uh, mean anything, uh, because when you start talking about data flows, inevitably you start talking about personal data. Any data can become personal. And then it's very interesting because in the U.S., uh, data flows privacy is a consumer protection issue. In Europe, it's a fundamental right. So maybe the U.S., when they talk about consumer protection, they also talk about privacy, and the EU uh, believes that it's not uh, part of uh, the trade agreement. Uh, it's also an issue in the financial services sector. It's another area where there are fundamental changes happening in Europe, reforms, and we are afraid that TTIP might actually lock Europe uh, in, uh, lock the legislative process in Europe. This is also relevant for the ongoing discussion about data protection that uh, we have discussed previously. Uh, Europe is currently reforming data protection laws, and then if you include data protection data flows privacy in the trade agreement, that means that for the next two, three years, any discussion will be locked, will be suspended in Europe. So it's a very indirect way of lowering the standards and having the business um, points taken through the back door through the trade agreement. The same when it comes to the safe harbor. There's a lot of discussion about transfer of data to, to, from the EU to the US. Uh, everybody's criticizing uh, safe harbor, we as well. Everybody's calling for suspension. But then if you include transfer of data in a negotiation of a trade agreement, that means that at, until this trade agreement is concluded, there will be no action uh, taken uh, with regards to the reform of the safe harbor. Uh, uh, the invest state dispute resolution is, as you can imagine, a horizontal concern that, that can affect all aspects. Um, it's really a transfer of sovereignty to the companies, and there is really no reason, apart from the examples, uh, a number of examples were already mentioned, uh, but, if you, but if you really think about it, it's like this system uh, gives uh, companies, grants companies uh, equal standing as to states, and then uh, the whole process, the whole dispute resolution, is outside the court system. Uh, this, this, the case will be decided by three investment lawyers. So um, if you think about it, it's really hard to imagine how the EU can accept uh, to recognize, to include this system that will inevitably uh, result in a lower of consumer protection. And do we really need it? Because there, are, there, is, a, um, there is a court system, very a good, well-functioning court systems in both the EU and the US. And then we have state-to-state -state, uh, resolution mechanism. So why do we need a, a, a system for investor dispute, investor state uh, dispute resolution? Uh, and there is also the point about the transparency. Uh, we're thinking, we're discussing about this today. And then um, we do not understand why there is uh, this concern about transparency because BEUC, for example, is part of, is part of the advisory board uh, for the TTIP, of course. Uh, with very limited access to the text, 
Uh, one example is the e-commerce chapter. There is a note that was provided by the U.S. administration to the EU, but we're not allowed to see it because it's not an EU paper, it's a U.S. paper. So although we are um, supposed to have access to uh, some of the documents, uh, in practice it doesn't work. And really, when you start uh, being concerned about transparency, you do not want to be transparent. For me, it really reminds me of a poker game, where you really do not want to reveal your cards to the opponent. So if we're talking about negotiations between two equal partners, why do we need all this secrecy, all this um, 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 secrecy, and we do not give uh, free access to the documents? And I just want to leave it there that the two systems in many areas of consumer uh, protection are so um, different by design and by default that a trade agreement cannot make them interoperable. Data protection is an issue, but uh, we cannot discuss about how to bring the two data protection systems uh, closer uh, within uh, trade negotiations. It should be done outside uh, trade negotiations. And I'll leave there. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, for this TTIP, uh, organization of consumer can protect or act, but also the citizen can act. Uh, so, for that, I will give the word to Ben, uh, who, will, who will explain to us uh, how to use crowdsourcing intelligence to defeat uh, the TTIP and the TAFTA agreement. So, um my my talk is is uh, based on the on the more activist side, which is um, I've been very worried about uh, the ESM treaty already, that that passed that Belgium, for example, was the last one to 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 vote, um, and so this installed austerity all over Europe. So when I saw the TTIP coming, I I, I thought, well, we already lost the ESM battle, um, so. What can we learn from, from this loss, and how, how can we repeat the win of ACTA and really uh, manage to defeat uh, TAFTA at a European level, and if possible, try to, to bridge this struggle with the US that, it, that is also fighting to, um, to abolish TPP, which is their own uh, uh, trade agreement but with, with the Pacific. And so my, my goal was really trying to, 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 to build or to connect all civil society together with uh, NGOs, with uh, political parties that want to, to take a, um, a courageous position on this matter and really protect uh, citizens' interests all over, all over the world, in fact. So um, I, my first conclusion was, if you go on the street and you ask someone, what is the ESM treaty? I think 80% of, of people on the street just simply don't know about it. They don't know their own government uh, voted for it. Uh, even if their own political party, for example, uh, had a position that was against, for example, the ESM treaty, uh, at the end of the day, and this is the case for Belgium, uh, one, person from, one person from the Socialist Party uh, really got out of the party, in fact, and positioned itself uh, against uh, the, um, the ESM treaty. Uh, some people from Ecolo also were against. But again, the, the, the whole line of the European uh, structure of uh, political groups and the whole, uh, the whole ideas of co coalitions make that uh, political parties at the national level sometimes are simply into a bandwagon where uh, they are not uh, able actually to, to go against the line of the party. And you can really see this on, on, the, on the ESM treaty where if some of the politicians were against, in the end of the day, the, the political party simply uh, managed to sign the treaty and, and, the, and, the, and the, the fight was over. So uh, for me, there was really the need to create a, a simple website, a simple database where people could get uh, information about TTIP in their own language. It, wa it was really important to, to, to reach the more possible uh, language in Europe, which is 28. It's not easy. The website is not complete. Um, in fact, it's a really an open call to, 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 
you know, bring more material if you, ha if you have, bring more uh, content in your own language if you have, because this is kind of a, of a aggregator, in fact, of the most, um, you know, the most interesting information we could find based on the research we did um, on a few language. But I I'm pretty sure a lot of information is missing, for example, in German or in, in Swedish or whatever, and there is a lot of countries missing. So the website is pafta.eu, P-A-F-T-A dot E-U, which is People Against Free Trade Agreements. It's a very simple, it's very easy to share, it's very easy to navigate, and it's very easy to really get the, 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 the basics of TTIP and then it, it, it have all the links, for, for example, of the 20, uh, excuse me, 19 updates uh, about TTIP that Glenn Moody has been producing based on the leaks, based on all the information that we could get at the moment, because during uh, maybe uh, the first few months of the negotiations, it was impossible to, add, to get any information, in fact. So there has been a few leaks since then. There is a, a, a green FA website which is storing um, a few documents that, is, that are not supposed to be uh, publicly available. Um, and so this is allowing civil society to, to make some, some you know, understanding about what's going to be prepared, what, what is going to be the final TTIP agreement. And I think uh, it, we really need a, a, an alliance between people like Glyn Moody that are able to follow and really build great information based on the leaks, based on the draft, based on the, the documents, and based on the affirmation of, the, for example, the TTP, TTIP team uh, in Europe. But then we need, we really need political parties that take, uh, you know, into, into their heart to, to bring this into this election here, European elections uh, 2014. We really need this to be, uh, to, to be, to be on, the, on, the, on the debate, on the ground, Otherwise, we are going to, be, to speak about the color of the shirts of uh, I don't know what politician, and we are not going to speak about the real issues that are going to impact our lives in the next uh, you know, years to, to, to come. And so this is, this is really uh, a call, in fact, because even if we have some grassroots movement in, in, uh, in Spain, in France, in Belgium, um, that are trying to really raise awareness about TTIP, we are very, very far away from the, the awareness that ACTA, for example, generated. We really need much more to, to, to be able to, to really give the, the, the EU Commission and the different, uh, like they, they like to, 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 to talk about, stakeholders. We are not stakeholders. We are people and we are going to be impacted by this the free, trade, the free trade agreements. We are not stakeholders. And I, I think this is, there is a lot of words being used that are totally fake and are giving a fake, um, you know, a fake uh, uh, report of reality. This is not what's going to happen. The impact, the impact of TTIP is the same impact of the austerity measures. When they got voted, when everything went uh, decided, uh, at the end of the day, Europe is obliged to do a, a Troika inquiry to know the impact of its own decision. We already know we have a lot of people that have all the information that we need about, uh, about NAFTA, for example, about previous free trade agreements. There is tons of free trade agreements. This, this is certainly not the last one, not the first one, but it's maybe the first time that civil society is taking a full, maybe a full, uh, you know, acknowledgement of the, the, the power of these free trade agreements and how they can impact real life, real people, nature, the planet and everything. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, important issue to bring on the EP uh, 2014 elections. It's a really important issue to bring on the street. It's a really important to, to bring NGOs, grassroots movements, political parties together and really have adopt a position where it's impossible for the EU commissions to continue these negotiations because it doesn't have the legitimacy, it doesn't have the, 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 the backing of basically of the whole civil society. And we are, we are not there, we are very far away from here because no matter how much noise we are doing, we, we had, a, for example, D9020 coalition here in Brussels did a demonstration when there was the fourth round of negotiation and we are a mini, mini minority. We are 200 people in front of the, of the Digi Trade Commission, and, and this is all we can really do here in Belgium. 
And even like that, we got help from, from activists from Germany, from, from Spain, from Portugal, from different countries that came just for this little demonst demonstration. But we need much more of that. And the, the, I think the only way to, 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 to have a large EU movement against TTIP is to really try to educate and really to bring this information everywhere and, 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 and you know, get the information in your own, own language so that everyone can get uh, all the information is needed about TTIP and it's, it doesn't need to be a mystery. It doesn't need to be the mystery that the ESM treaty is, which half of the people doesn't know about it and we are going, we are being governed. We are under this treaty since the, the, the austerity uh, imposition and right now there is no way or mechanism to go back. The ESM treaty is signed uh, we are not going to go back because we failed to, to, to change it or to, you know, to shape this treaty. We, we, we totally failed as a society to, to say, okay, this is not going to work and we don't need this kind of austerity and this is going to have a huge impact and you know, people from Greece, people from Spain, Portugal, Italy really know and do understand the real impact of these austerity measures. If we let this TTIP go on, then it's not just on, on, on goods and, and, you know, about consumption or uh, it's going to have an impact on everything that we know today. So it's really, really important as a, as, a, as a European society, we manage to bridge and create links and bonds together so that we can stop it. That's my call. Voilà. So, so thank you, Ben. But uh, if we have no one who thinks that TTIP can be a good idea, we cannot make a debate. So <laughs> I, I think it's, it's also good to have the other opinion and point of view. So I will give the word to Mr. Willy Kampmann, who is uh, working for the German Agricultural Federation. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for the invitation. I will not cover the full picture of uh, the negotiation with the Americans, then focus a bit more on our sector, agriculture and food. Let me put one, one sentence before. Different to speakers before and other groups uh, discussing about TTIP, I don't suppose that the Commission is negotiating and discussing in the disadvantage of European consumers and the European economy. That is a clear statement. Then when we fear all this, then indeed we would have to stop the negotiations. And what sense would it make the Commission negotiating against our interests? Please tell me. That would be absolutely stupid in my sense. Agreed. Would be stupid. <laughs> Though and at the end, and at the end, to be honest, at the end, it's not the Commission who decides. The Commission negotiates. And at the end, the results on the, are on the table. They go into Council, they go into the European Parliament, in this House here, and then they are evaluated. And I'm sure if there is something against our interest, the negotiations will fail. It's, to me, a very open option. It's, to me, a very open option. But beforehand, blaming the Commission, dealing in our, against our interests, sorry, to me it's bullshit. So, uh, though now uh, just a few points for, for coming into the debate. What are the driving forces? What are the driving forces for this uh, negotiation? First of all, it's a weak position um, in, in the economy of the US and EU. And in the EU, in average, the economy is still very weak, except some countries, one of them is Germany. But in overall, in average, when you look at the average figures, the EU economy is still weak. It was the same in the US, but the US is catching up faster. The second point is um, accelerating economic growth after very deep financial and economic crisis. That it's one, uh, it's a second driving force. And last but not least, EU and the US, they want to strengthen their position on the worldwide perspective because uh, there are a lot of uh, new players that there is a quite a balance. Number two, it's a mandate. 
I really recommend, please read sentence by sentence the mandate the Commission got from the European Council and uh, from the European Parliament has been discussed here in this room and the, the European Parliament has accepted. And I can tell you, I can tell you for our sector, for, for uh, food agriculture and food security, in the mandate the Commission has is nothing against our interests, absolutely nothing. Is, if this is at the end the result, I will put in question, therefore they're negotiating. And what is it? First of all is dismantling of all uh, custom duties, all tariffs, exempt some sensitive product lines, and the most sensitive products lines which will be designed will be in the agriculture and food sector, uh, mainly on all kinds of uh, beef, etc. Uh, number, uh, point number two for, for us very, as, as European producers, uh, as European producers and processors, is the protection of geographical indications. And here in the European in the Union, we have some 120, 130 uh, protected geographical indications. That means, for example, Parma ham or, or, or um, Cham champagne from, from France, etc. Even in Germany, we don't have that many. May, uh, most of them are in Italy and in, in the thousand in the Mediterranean countries. Though there's no question about it to negotiate about this. And uh, let me remind you, in the negotiations with Canada, uh, fixed last or fi finalized last year, Canada has fully accepted all the protection of all geographical indication. I really didn't believe this, that can Canada would go th that, that far. Uh, but at the end, they have accepted the protection of our, of our uh, geographical uh, indications. Point number two, it has been all mention, mentioned here already, uh, GMOs. I'm a bit, uh, I have a bit of a different position to GMO, GMOs. I don't have any problems with uh, genetic, genetically modified uh, varieties. But it's not my personal view is, uh, let's say, is important rather than, let's say, the European view. And we have a very strict legislation on GMOs. And this is also in the mandate, this legislation on GMOs is not for discussion. The Americans have to, be, have to accept it, and exactly this point has just discussed here in the fourth round of negotiations a few days before here in Brussels. GMO is not for debate, then the, then the uh, negotiations will fail. It's very clear to me. Yes. But on the other side, when I see what's going on on the sector of GMOs, worldwide we have, in the meantime, we have 170 million hectares planted with GM-modified crops. And the fastest growth you see in emergency countries and in the least developed countries. Here you see, the, for example, India. You see, you see the fastest grow on gen genetically modified varieties. For example, in cotton in India, a big, big advantage to the farmers in India. And we have contacts, we have contacts uh, with our Indian colleagues. Next week I will be at the World Farmers Congress in Buenos Aires, and there will also be a delegation from India. And you can be sure that we very, very differentiate to discuss with, with our colleagues what, what are all these arguments that, for example, for GM crops, the rate of suicides in India is increasing. This has nothing to do with GM crop. It has to do because there is not a proper financial system in, in, in India, that they have, farmers have to pay interest rates of 20, 30, or up to 40 percent. That is a core issue why the problem in, in Indian agriculture is that difficult. So, and then uh, um, to, to uh, cut it off, all standards, when it comes to food security, all standards are also not negotiable. It's also very clear uh, laid down in the mandate. Yeah, for example, uh, uh, in, in US, uh, let's say the um, uh, um, beef production with the input of hormones or pork production with the input of ractopamine. This is not, it's not for discussion. It's not for discussion. Although this glorification of, of uh, let's say, of uh, poultry, 
Yes. But, uh, and I'm very often in the US. I'm very often in the US. I'm, but I'm also often surprised how simple we think that things in the US are. Do you really believe the Americans they are going to poison their consumers? They have, they have. Yes. 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 Oh my God. What do you think of oh from McDonald's? Oh my God. <laughs> no, come on. We have a lot. We have a lot of context uh, in the in the U.S. in the U.S. And I can assure you, when you look into the legislation, they they have a as high sensitivity to uh, consumer protection and food security than we have. But what is different? But what is different? But, is, but the different is, let's say, is a, a procedure. The Americans, they have a very clear risk-based assessment. And we in Europe, we have a so-called process-based system, what makes production much more expensive. For example, in the production of one kilogram poultry meat, this process, uh, 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 process in, in, let's say, in food, food security, make some extra 30 euro cent in costs against the, uh, against the American. But there is no proof that the American poultry, it's proven by the EFSA here of the European Commission, it's not proven or it's not evident that the American product is not safe or has any danger or harm to the consumers. So at the end, there is a safeguard, a safeguard, clause, safeguard clause foreseen. If they are raising any problems on the market, each size has a possibility to interfere and to stop uh, this individual products. Expectations, I can cut up. Uh, the first speaker, uh, Mr. Moody, had already put the figures, uh, 120 billion euros for, for the European Union, 100, some 100 uh, billion euros for the Americans. I don't discuss if it are 100 or 80 or just 50 or just 60. I'm convinced there is, a, there is a real profit. And I see it, for example, I see it from the, and the real profit is, com, is not coming from, uh, let's say, abolishing the customs duties. The real uh, profit is coming from harmonizing systems. And I know it from our famous car makers in Germany, all of them, have already production plants in, in the U.S. Selling a BMW there, uh, selling a Mercedes there, selling a Porsche there. And when you discuss with those people, the, the different, for example, the different security standards in the, cars, in the car sector. Yes. And here it's the same. I see the American car as safe as the German car or as the European car. But there are also differences. There are also differences how to, to deal with it. And this difference makes 70, uh, sorry, 7,000 US dollar per car. This difference is just a cost reduction when it at the end, uh, the negotiations will find a solution to harmonize the systems. Just a few figures uh, to uh, EU, uh, US trade today, even when you will be able to stop TTIP. I don't think that that will happen. Uh, that will not, will not stop the trade we have already with the Americans. Uh, for example, we uh, export today, last year, for 292 billion euros European products to the, Amer to, to, to the US. And uh, vice versa, the US exports to Europe, let's say, product in a value of 205 billion euros. Though that makes, uh, at the end, a uh, trade surplus for the European Union by 87 billion euros per year. In agriculture, it's a bit uh, different. Uh, we export to the US uh, in value for 50 billion euros products. And uh, the US export to the European Union, uh, let's say, products in a value of 8 billion euros. That makes Although the European Union, Union already today has a trade surplus with, towards the U.S. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference when you look a bit uh, detailed into the products and into the, the figures and what is exported. And you see uh, very significant differences. The EU is very strong in exporting value-added products, consumer-ready products. 
yeah, where cons consumers in U.S. right away can buy and consume. And the Americans, they are more focused on exporting commodities, for example, uh, soya, corn, etc. That's uh, the big uh, difference. And uh, all in all, uh, the trends in trade with or without TTIP uh, are positive when it comes to trade. So what is now the state of the negotiations? Has been already mentioned, the fourth round has, has taken place this week um, in uh, Brussels, and the next round is scheduled for before the summer break in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, when it comes to the discussions up to now, up to now they just just debates about the structure of the negotiations. It, let's say you have a lot of subjects, uh, uh, subjects and uh, subtitles, and they are defining, let's say, on what issues we won't discuss and we will discuss. So there, up to now, there is no exchange on concrete offers from one or the uh, other side. And now to the strategy. It has been, uh, although by the speaker before, criticized the uh, strategy of communication, uh, uh, how these negotiations uh, go. Uh, I would say to our part, when it comes to agriculture and food, I feel we have enough debate with the European Commission in inofficial and also in official fora uh, to discuss what is at stake, what is the state of play. Last week we had uh, the big advisory committee where the Commission invites all the stakeholders and for our sector, for food, uh, uh, your organization has been also uh, present there and explaining, explaining the situation. Uh, though I guess, or let me, let me put it the other way around, I feel I have a full picture what is at the moment uh, at stake. But as it's uh, clear the Commission can't put on the table, if you has asked all the details, all the papers and details, they are negotiating. Okay, it's like, uh, like gambling. You have to have, it's let's say... transparency. And you have the you have the transparency you have the transparency uh, you have full transparency at least at the end when it comes to decision by the different by the different uh, by the different uh, no then we, you can stop the negos then you can stop the negotiations when the the, the, the commission would play all his, uh, put all his cards on the table yes it's my uh, it's my position of, of this. So, but they started a new communication strategy in Europe, in the U.S. Uh, the Commission will do a new lobbying. They have set a new committee uh, inviting all, uh, all uh, the full range of civil society. But I, I feel they will not, let's say, act differently. Yes, and and uh, let's say not in any detail put everything on the table. But here again, I don't suppose that the Commission acts against our interest. So uh, at the end, uh, last two sentences, what is the position of the European, far, uh, European agriculture and food sector? We have in detail, in detail, we have discussed with the, the European Farmers Organization, COPA, just around the corner here, uh, in detail, we have discussed with the European food industry, uh, Food Drink Europe. In detail, we have discussed pro product by product, standard by standard, and have really de defined the differences, the differences between US and the EU. And our conclusion out of this is there are some differences. And when it comes to the, it has also been mentioned, when it comes to the input of plant protection products, you have in U.S. you have products forbidden, who, which are allowed, for example, in apple production, who are for allowed in Europe. So you can't say per se uh, we are stricter in Europe than the Americans are. That's absolutely not true. That's absolutely not true. Though so to sum up our last sentence, we as a farming sector and all the food industry, if there is a balanced outcome. Under the condition I have mentioned with the standards, GMO, etc., etc., and geographical indi indications, we feel that the European agriculture and food sector has real good chances, although on the American markets. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, so the last word will be for Gregory. I think I don't have to present you Gregory Engels. Uh, so for Gregory, uh, the TTIP is obsolete uh, because the World Trade Organization has passed the Bali package. So I leave him the words. Uh, not too long, my, my friend. Yeah, well, I'll try. Um, well, thank you, and um, thank you, Mr. Kampmann, for such uh, uh, insight into, um, into this uh, view on TTIP, and also for giving me a lot of arguments, actually, um, to make my point. Um, first, it's said that one needs to read the mandate that the Commission have, the negotiation commit, uh, mandate. Well, the problem is I would love to. Uh, the Commission have not published it. This mandate has been leaked and then been leaked again, and then leaked some other version. Now there's something leaked that's called the final version. I don't know if it is final, if it's really think, if it's somebody, well, they're not denying anything, but it's, it's, not, it's just not sure if it's this actually the mandate I, I'm reading, the mandate that they're actually negotiating with. Um, but of course, you might have other channels to get them. Um, we, as a civil society, or as a consumer, do not have. So this is the point. Um, the TTIP is being negotiated completely and transparent. And it, in the end, we will see what the result is. And then we have the choice to take it all or give it, leave it all. So there's no way to contribute in the negotiation process, no way to, um, to actually to influence it in any possible way. I also believe, of course, that the European Commission follows the interest of the citizens of Europe and um, would never uh, produce something that would be of fundamental harm to Europe. Uh, but the problem is that I also believe that the priorities may be not be the same priorities that I would have. Uh, I believe that such um, secret negotiation only um, leads to the representation of interests of 1% and leaving out the 99% of uh, citizens of Europe. So as I've um, been introduced, uh, I'm, I'm here for the tease that TTIP is actually obsolete. If you look into the history of how it started, um, it's been started like something like around 2006, when the Chancellor Merkel of Germany firmly believed that the Doha negotiation round of the WTO has failed. It's been sitting there in a deadlock and actually it took another, another like seven years to actually move on, which happened in the 7th of December in Bali uh, last year. And now we have moved along a lot of the way on the Doha negotiation round. And you, I know that some people also like uh, opposing the WTO as organization and uh, the negotiations round, but the fundamental difference to what we see with the bilateral secret negotiations like ACTA wars, like CEP, um, like the um, TTIP is, um, is that negotiations inside the WTO actually include the interest of everybody, including the interest of emerging um, economies, of developing countries, and least developed countries. And they are transparent. That's a surprise. But actually, as I visit Bali, uh, and before that, um, you can go to WTO webpage and see the negotiation documents, what is actually being negotiated. And you see what has not been agreed yet in a consensus put in a square brackets. So you need, this is a text what is on the table, and there are some differences, and you know exactly what bits of text are not being agreed on. So to remind you, this, um, so it's also a, a, another argument, thank you, we already do a lot of trade with uh, the United States, and this is for our own interest. Actually, we have a very low barriers, um, except for the agricultural sector, but other than that, we have a lot of, um, we have not that much barriers, actually, left from the duty perspective, from the tariffs perspective. We do have some red tape, we have some um, barriers that are actually non-tariff barriers, so like, it's a, it's a hassle to like work with American businesses, there are a lot of regulations. And this is um, the focus of the TTIP agreement, also to reduce that, to access, to make an access to the market easier, to make it easier for European countries, companies also to bid for the public sector tenders and vice versa. 
um, which will be interesting anyway. Um, but actually, I think it might be a good thing. We need to see how the detail is, but actually I don't see why the um, like German companies are excluded from public tenders uh, from the US government. Uh, why shouldn't Siemens be possible, uh, sh shouldn't be like offering uh, his services to US government? Uh, why they should be protected and saying only US companies only? So that's, um, well, Siemens is a bad example since there are also U.S. companies as well. <laughs> well, but since, um, remind you, um, 1995, so before the Doha round, before the WTO negotiations, there was some process started called uh, May, uh, the Multilateral Agreement on Investment, um, which was a big package, also secret. And actually it failed 1998 as France um, withdrew from it and said they would block it. Uh, and this happened actually after massive campaign, uh, from grassroots campaign, and people have expressed a lot of um, disappointment. And actually the arguments against this were very similar to what we hear today against the TTIP. Um, and as a result of that, the negotiations moved to the WTO, to the Doha round, and included the points of criticism, included the interests of least developed countries. And the only reason to begin with TTIP negotiations was because Doha wasn't moving anywhere, which now has moved. And actually, the Bali package, if you look at it, focus on, the, on access to markets, on, on reducing the red tape, reducing the bureaucracy, easing the access to markets, and also including the developing country, including like no duty-free, quarter-free access um, to the markets for the developing countries. And I think that's the way to go, and we should continue that in an open process because this is a lot of the negotiations actually happening, and I can see how civil society is getting involved. You can actually like, be live there. I was. Um, so the investor state dispute settlement is also regulated in the WTO with the international settlement mechanism. And you can, um, so basically, what the ISDS also say. Um, that, of course, it's not something that you say you need to you be forced to do something. You can, you can choose not to do anything. You can choose to block um, some technologies for environmental reasons or for moral reasons. But um, ISDS mechanism basically says, yes, you can do that, but there will be a cost attached to that. So like Canada now paying like 250 million uh, fine for not allowing fracking uh, in Quebec. Um, so, for example, I understand that like, there that would be no harm done and probably really like genetic modified food is off the table, but a lot of technologies are not. Um, for example, there's a lot of big energy corporations inside the U.S. who are doing nuclear power plants, and nuclear power plants are okay in some parts of Europe. In other parts of Europe, like France and Germany, uh, they're completely off the table. So basically, uh, if uh, that's the same well, it's more threatening. We don't know what will be in the end there. But right now, we can assume um, that there could be settlement cases against um, missing investment um, on nuclear power plants. So to sum it up, we don't need TTIP as it had been negotiated now. We need to stop it and reopen it completely and do it in a transparent process so that TTIP would also work for the 99%. Thank you very much. So thank you, Greg. Uh, now we can go to the question. Um, I have a question for the sir in the middle. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Um, for me, for de democracy to work, I need to be able to make an informed decision on what I'm voting at. To, make, to be able to make an informed decision, I need transparency. Europe and the U.S. are considered bastions of transparency. How come we keep doing these things behind closed doors while we could just open it to the public? Because I think in America the, the demand for transparency is the same. Uh, 
I don't, I don't think that these are decisions behind closed doors. It may be some years ago that was a case when the European Parliament was not, uh, let's say, in a co-decision. That, then it was right. Then, it, then decisions have been taken behind closed door in the, in, in the Council amongst ministers and heads of government. But today it's all discussed here in this House and the committee discussions on the mandate on TTAP in this house have been open. I, 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 uh, I uh, joined each meeting here following the debates. To me, it's not a secret. Of, uh, this has something, <laughs> but this has something. It is to everyone else in this room, though. That's but the problem. But you're not in the position of, uh, of, uh, but of this has, citizens. This has something. This has some, I'm also a European citizen. This has something to do with the construction of the European Union was questions being not democratic enough. That is clear. And now they're starting, and they're starting step by step catching up with the Lisbon Treaty. A big step ha has been made. And now with more and more integration, let's say due to the uh, financial and, and economic crisis, we see in other steps other steps of, of, of better integration and more democratic influence. I'm with you, let, let's say that, that, that maybe the, in, in, in the construction, is inbuilt in the construction of the European Union as it is at the moment, that, that we feel there is not enough transparency as we see it in our national, in, in our national parliaments. Uh, I'm with you that we need further steps. Yes, but uh, there is not a, di a discussion behind closed door. That is absolutely not true. Other question? In front, Jonas. Okay, um, uh, the, I think the best point which Common made is that uh, why would the European Commission act uh, against the interests of the European people? Maybe the other people can reply to that argument? Yes? Well, I think one of the reasons to explain this, uh, this argument is that um, there is a huge gap between citizens and representatives. For me, there is a crisis, not only a European crisis, a financial crisis, there is a representative crisis. And this is one of the big reasons why the people that are behind the closed doors are not representing us. They are not representing us. So, of course, they are doing the best they can in their own interest or the interest for whom they work for. And for example, why the farmers, why the farmers, if they are the farmers are, uh, are on, you know, with this with you, why uh, the Belgian farmers got on the D1920 coalitions and why they are fighting TTIP? This is exactly the, 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 the same uh, problem of representativity. It is the, the farmers on the ground are not part of the same lobbies that are in fact building the agriculture of tomorrow that are not representing farmers. He is not representing farmers. He is representing a lobby of interest, a corporate interest. And this is not the people who we vote for. We, we don't want this to be the, the, the main construct of our democracy. We, want, we don't want to, to, to have an advisory group of the TTIP to be, I don't know the exact numbers, you can find all this information on, for example, on the website Corporate Europe Observatory. But the advisory group is composed of lobbyists or big pharmace uh, pharmaceutical groups of big uh, food, uh, no, food interests that wants to push the, 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 the TTIP in the way that, that Europe is pushing it now. So for me, Europe doesn't want to, to of course, doesn't want, want us to, to eat poison or I don't know what. But slowly and step by step by step, there is going to be an unwanted deregulation, if you want to say, because, of course, uh, they are going to repeat, no, we don't want to deregulate, we don't want to deregulate, and they are going to assure us that they are not going in the direction, in the direction of how we citizens can be afraid of. So it seems that with one tweet, it's enough to say, uh, we are not going into, the, into this direction, you should trust us, you should believe, and, uh, of course, we are really working for your best interest. Well, this could work if there was a trust between citizens and representatives. There is no trust. And I think this is, this is becoming general. So and, uh, uh, we have one thing to do. We have to vote 
for representatives that we trust. And then we can change society, and then we can change the, 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 the game and the powers that are at play. If we don't, if we're not able to do this, then we are going to be governed by representatives that are, I don't know, career politics, or call it whatever they want, but they are not doing their mandate. They are not representing us, they are not representing our, our, our interests as a citizens. Can and I this is why there is a big gap, in my opinion, between what they are negotiating and what, who, I mean, what society would want. And for that there is, for example, the alternative, tr uh, alternative trade mandate, which is very interesting, takes into account the planet, 99% of the population, and many <laughs> other aspects. Can I pick up on that? Because there are a lot of things there. There's one word that was cropping up in there a lot, which is lobbies and lobbyists. And one of the big issues, I think, is the power of lobbyists in Brussels and in national governments. For example, one thing I wrote about was there was a meeting between the European Commission and what they called civil society. This was an example of their transparency. And it turned out that two-thirds of the people in the civil society meeting were big companies. And this is how they define civil society, it's companies. And similarly, there have been meetings between the chief negotiator for the European Union and the American Chamber of Commerce in Europe. And this was a very expensive, you know, 5,000 euros kind of thing you had to pay to go into. I mean, there have been no comparable things for the citizens. So the whole system is geared towards lobbyists, is geared towards the large companies, and geared towards the people with lots of money. So it's a systemic problem we need to address. Give the word to, to, to Mr. and then to you. Uh, sh uh, two short comments. In May, you have all the, all the, all the chance to elect your representative who, who defends your interests. Then we have, we have elections for the European uh, Parliament. And what we are doing is we are, we are advising our members, our farmers in Germany, please invite all the candidates from all parties and discuss with them your concerns, what you would see them to do for you. An open process. So you were criticizing, uh, let's say, representation uh, amongst farmers, that we don't represent uh, the majority of farmers. May I remind you, I just know the situation very exactly in Germany. In Germany, 93% of all German farmers on a voluntary base are organized in our organization. And my salary is paid by farmers on a voluntary basis. When I don't do the right thing for our farmers, I can assure you what they have learned is they wave with their membership card. That's absolutely not true when you are talking here and mentioning a small group which is existing in Belgium, that is right. We have the same group in Germany that all the smaller group of farmers, or farmers in Germany representing, I guess, one or two percent of all farmers, although against TTIP. Though in a democratic system, I ask you what is right. And it's absolutely not wrong that we uh, defend the interests for big farmers. As I said, we have 93 percent of all farmers are organized in our organization, in Deutsche Bauernverband, in uh, our regional organization and district organizations, and in average, the farm size is uh, 40 hectares. This is a big farm. So be, please don't tell here, uh, let's say, give wrong information. And I have to discuss on a very open process with our members. We have it uh, the other week, we have it in our presidium. We discuss with all regional farmers' organizations, on, although on TTIP. Do you really believe they, 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 I can do here what I want? I have a democratic authorization. And I asked you, what democratic authorization do you have? Do, do, do you have explaining here we have to, top, uh, to stop TTIP? That is what I wanted to know. I think we see, I see, I think we see. I think we see the point, so the, the both point, but we have still a question. I have one girl here on question. I have Atos there a question. I have Mr. there a question. So we, we begin with the, the you. We are. No, Rick, it was the girl here. <laughs> Sorry. No, so I also wanted to talk about interest and just uh, globally say that we don't have a society with uh, one interest for the society, but we have power struggles and groups struggling for it with different interests. 
um, and that my interests might not be the interest of the negotiators, but it was said before. And then I wanted to say, okay, we, uh, at least in the room, probably uh, agree quite a lot. And I wanted to ask globally, where is the ACTA coalition? Um, are we, like, how is the, the struggle um, and the um, care that we're going to give to TTIP and CETA and other uh, future agreements uh, coming? Um, are we talking with other groups about that and um, what will be our global strategy of all of us, um, especially the panel uh, people? Yeah, it was more, well... Uh, it, it was more a remark. I appreciate, we appreciate it. So I can ask to, the, to Atos and to Mr. Ost what they, I want to ask or to say. Yeah, hello. Uh, Markus Bartagenhoff from the German Pirates. Um, I have a question to Mr. Kampmann. Um, um, again, to the point where you said you can't imagine that the European Commission does something against the interests of the, of the people. And in those negotiations, um, as far as or what I've seen throughout the leagues, are those cases mentioned in the beginning that uh, cases are removed from courts to other places and this uh, is something, at least for me, as, a, as, as someone who lives here, um, um, is a bad thing. So this part is, is not good uh, negotiated. And the problem is now that uh, the people who have read things like that, and I believe there are a lot of them here, don't really believe anymore. This is a crisis in, in trust. So, uh, but I think um, the, 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 the thing that was mentioned uh, before, that transparency really can help there. I believe that you really want to do good things for the people in Europe with your organization. You have good knowledge about all those agricultural things. Um, you have access to the information, so you say for you it's an open process. Let all the 500 million other people participate if they want. I think um, there are so many people who have good ideas, who are also professionals in their cases. We have lawyers there, we have lots of people with good ideas. And so maybe it would be a good idea for, for your organization to lobby for more transparency in here because you don't then get all those arguments, it's intransparent, because you can say, we are the guys who open it, and you can bring your positions more clearly, and everyone can bring its input to this discussion. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Angelos Karlaftis. Uh, honorable citizen, Mr. Kapman, uh, I'm very sorry that everybody is against you, but you are speaking in a very uh, dubious way. Uh, because if you are representing the farmers uh, or the corporations or the agricultural uh, sector in Germany, then uh, why are we negotiating to a field where we have the benefit? Why we do to negotiate with the Americans apart from the 40 last years we are always negotiating with them and we should negotiate with all the nations without, with all the other territorial zones in a, in a democratic basis. The farmers in Germany, I don't think they will feel well when they are going to, to lose their benefits from your negotiations. Thank you very much. So I think it's for you. Okay, a uh, short reaction. A crisis and confident, I can, I can sign. We have in the European Union, we have, but not just focused on TTIP. We have a, a crisis in the acceptance of the European Union, especially in the months, uh, amongst the young generation. And I feel it, I see it when I discuss with my kids uh, about uh, the European Union and the benefits. Uh, though I can, I can, I can assign this. But I'm also sure that when it comes to TTIP, that uh, the Commission has learned his lesson, uh, that there has been an enormous criticism about the transparency of the, the negotiations. I get they will react to this and, and start, as I said, they are working on a new communicating strategy to it. And let's hope that at the end the right information you need, you need to, bet, uh, to get a better confidence um, will uh, show up. Uh, to the last uh, question, uh, now we discussed here just about T 
TTIP, but uh, that the, the position of uh, the German Farmers Organization, although uh, the, the European Farmers Organization, Co uh, COPA here, um, and this has also mentioned, we are in favor of negotiations on the multilateral basis in Geneva. Yeah, that is very, very clear. That's a very, very clear condition. But we also see, we also see, let's say, what happened there, that there is a stalemate since 2001, and that's where we met in Bali in the last WTO ministerial conference. We follow very, very closely and, and, and really lobbied for, uh, lobbied for a positive outcome, and we saw in Bali, let's say, a small, a small package, and we really believe that this decision from Bali will fuel up, uh, let's say, the multilateral negotiations uh, on WTO. That is the most fair negotiating system with strong and weaker partners. Yeah? So, because we saw this, uh, let's say, this blocking situation in WTO, a lot of countries, not, 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 uh, 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 not before the European Commission, started bilateral, uh, tra uh, let's say, negotiating bilaterally with, with, with countries who have something to give and something uh, to take. And first of all, the Americans. And for the Commission, for the European Commission, uh, to be in this ongoing globalized process, to, to be not uh, on the side they also have to start and, and, and to negotiate. But also for the Commission, they are in, in very, very interest of a, a multilateral trade agreement. And if it's true or not, I can't evaluate. Even the Commission believes via an agreement, via a fair agreement between the Americans and the Europeans, that could give all the new impetus, impetus to, uh, let's say, the, to the WFO. WTO and the position of developing countries has mentioned here. The European Union is uh, open, the open market for, for, Europe, for developing, for the least developed countries. We have uh, more imports from developing countries than all other countries together. Though, and I believe with an agreement, if there is an agreement between US and uh, the EU, this will also be transferred into to, uh, the American that they also have to give a preference also to, uh, to uh, developing countries without having a final result in the WTO. That could be a side effect in case if there is a balanced uh, agreement we all can accept. Thank you. Uh, yes, and don't forgive you, Rick. Uh, it will be the last, I'm sorry, Guy. Uh, yes, Rick, you have begun this, this uh, funding conference yesterday. I uh, hope you can conclude it with a positive, not a question, but a positive thing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I hope it's going to be positive. I'm going to ask Mr. Kaufmann for, for a closing word, actually. But I'm going to give a very candid question, and it may come across as humorous. It's certainly going to be very honest. Uh, Mr. Kaufmann, when you're addressing this audience, you're addressing the most intelligent politicians in Europe. It's, uh, you ask what democratic rep representation and what democratic mandate we have. Uh, it might not come as a surprise that we have several hundred elected representatives, including in the European Parliament itself, and in national parliaments across Europe and in other national and regional levels. So, since we are asking questions of you, I might take the opportunity to answer that question from you. However, I'm concerned that, to be quite honest, your relation to fundamental concepts of reality seem more than elastic. When you're describing the pr negotiation process of T TTIP as thoroughly transparent and banging your figuratively banging your head in the table to underscore it, saying there has been no such thing as closed doors. This, this assembly, this, these collections of people will notice that you're then deviating and deflecting the question into talking about parliaments and transparency in parliaments. And these people will remember that the only thing, the only, only time when ACTA, which is negotiated in a, in a, was negotiated in a fairly similar way to TTIP, the only time that was brought up in the European Parliament 
was in a hearing with the Commission which was very strictly in camera, which is fine Latin for literally closed doors. So, as, however, these people are also very candid, open, and honest, so seeing how you unfortunately, and banging your head, banging your head, uh, sorry, not head, hand <laughs> against the table, insisting on things that are simply perceived as overdrafting your credibility worse than the Eurozone, sir. I would take the opportunity to ask you honestly, what do you, please lay aside your mask as a lobbyist for a second. Do you see that these people are genuinely concerned that laws that bind this parliament are being negotiated in a way that doesn't have democratic oversight? Do you understand the concerns of these people? And if you take off your mask as a representative of German farmers, is that personally a world you'd like to leave to your children, sir? Thank you. First of all, you are, let's say, you are um, notice about the intelligence in this room. I can only say it's, it's in your hand to decide about the intelligence in this room. Elect the right people who are intelligent to take the right decision in your interest. And what was the problem up to now? Uh, the European society up to now didn't uh, have any interest in the European election. Who is going for uh, European Parliament? Today in Germany, there was a new, uh, there was a new survey today, just 20% of the, of the German uh, population has an interest in European uh, election. So there's no wonder that maybe not always the right people are here. But you can't blame the people who are here and elected. Uh, you, have to you have to blame us for not going uh, electing and not uh, looking for the right quality. And I mentioned before, we are inviting in our regional organizations all candidates going from all parties. From all parties, we invite all candidates to explain to us what, is, what you are doing for us, for us as farmers. Though totally transparency, I guess I have uh, limited it. Uh, I can understand that the Commission can't put all the cards on the table. Then they, they had not to go to negotiation. Yes, but how the process works, I guess we are very well informed. And I'm, not, uh, I'm sure when at the end there is a result on the table, and the European community of farmers is very, very vocal against it, I believe then there will be hardly any decision. And I can assure you, we evaluate the outcome of the negotiations, we follow the different steps, and we evaluate the outcome of the negotiation very, very closely and will uh, adequately lobby to the European Council and also here in this House to the European uh, Parliament at the end to get the decisions. What we think is in the interest of all farmers in, uh, in Europe. And our counterparts in the U.S., we are also very, uh, discussing in very detail with the American Farmers Organizations. And Bob Stallman, the president over there, said in, in the U.S. there will be no acceptance of a deal when the farmers say no. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the time is very, very, very over. Sorry, no, no, it is very over. So we will thank you very much uh, so for coming to this conference all the day. Uh...